Good evening, all, and welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Levi Sussex. I'm the acting director of the Institute of Languages, Cultures, and Societies. Uh, and I really am delighted that you're all here uh, for this eighth Miller lecture, um, which is, of course, organized by the Research Center uh, for Austrian and German Exile Studies. For us, for us, the ILCS, um, as host to the Research Center, this Miller Lecture is one of the focal points in our, uh, our calendar because it is an opportunity to celebrate and to showcase the work we do uh, in exile studies. Um, and I think it also is important to say that it highlights the continued importance of what we do, of exile studies. Um, I think we all feel it very acutely uh, in these weeks that uh, we cannot possibly understand uh, the events in the Middle East if we do not understand the, the, the history of um, Jewish persecution. I am particularly delighted to welcome Barb Farnes, um, our speaker tonight, who's done so much to bring the story of refugees to thousands of readers in his wonderful book, The Cutout Girl. Um, and that book, I think, shows the value of our discipline in a very poignant way. And I'll just give you a little quote from the Times Literary Supplement Review, um, which came out in 2018 at the publication of the book. And just this sentence, it is a reminder of the extraordinary richness of archives and the treasures released by scholarly research. And that's exactly what it is. And I think, you know, this is also what, what we treasure here. So I will hand over to uh, Tony Grenville in a moment for him to properly introduce Bart. Uh, so all I now want to do here is to say a word of thanks. Um, I want to thank the researchers associated with the center for making it the vibrant hub that it is. Um, I want to say thank you to the archivists, and I see the former and the current archivists sitting here um, who don't just look after the archives and make them searchable and catalog them, but also take them out into the real world by doing excellent public engagement work. I want to say thank you to the administrator, Jane Lewin, who makes it all happen, including this evening. Uh, and finally, uh, very heartfelt thanks to Daniel Miller um, for his generosity and continued support. Uh, the support is very gratefully received. Um, and with these words, I hand over to Tony to do a proper introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Gardela, and a, a special thanks, of course, to our speaker this evening, Professor Bart Van Es. Uh, my name's Anthony Grenville. I'm the chair of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies. As my parents came here from Vienna, I was delighted to hear Gardela call it the Research Centre for Austrian and German Exile Studies. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, I would like, just like to second uh, the thanks that Godola expressed to all those who've made uh, this evening possible. Um, now, our speaker this evening is definitely a man of parts because he is actually uh, a Shakespeare expert from Oxford. And the most recent thing that, of his that I've read was a piece in the Times Literary Supplement um, which dealt with two dramatists who are lesser known contemporaries of Shakespeare's. But uh, this evening, he's going to talk about something completely different because in mid-career, uh, he embarked on a completely new direction and produced this wonderful book, which Godola has introduced uh, you to, um, The Cutout Girl. Uh, in which he uh, shows us the process by which he uncovered the story of a little, a little Jewish girl 
who had been hidden by his grandparents during the war. A very moving story, very movingly presented. Now, uh, people hidden during the war play a considerable part in Dutch literature, both fiction and history. Uh, the Dutch word for a person who is in hiding is onderdeka, and uh, there are a lot of them, as I've said, in, in, in written about in Dutch, uh, probably because there were a lot of them in historical fact in Holland. Also partly because the most uh, celebrated on the Doka in any language, that's Anne Frank, uh, went into hiding, wrote her famous diary and was arrested in Holland. Um, another example, just to, 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 to quote um, a very uh, successful novel, uh, Harry Moolish's The Aanslag, uh, which deals with the uh, assassination by the Dutch resistance of um, a notorious uh, collaborator with the Nazis, with the, with the reprisals by the Germans and with the effects of those reprisals down the decades. Um, it's very skillfully and uh, suspensefully plotted, so I won't say any more about it except that uh, hidden people do play a key role in the plot. Um, this sort of um, what I would call historical quest literature um, is uh, a, a, a sort of a new subgenre almost. Uh, and Books like The Cutout Girl have uh, promoted a sort of literature that, that uh, is both history uh, and memoir, um, and that departs from conventional historical narrative because it doesn't just present its findings uh, as conventional history does, but quite differently, it takes the reader or readers um, with the author on the journey, on the search, in this case, for the cutout girl. Um, it describes the process of the search itself. Um, and therefore, you follow the author um, in his or her uh, efforts to reach historical truth insofar as one can ever reach that. Uh, you as the reader observe the author uh, reaching dead ends, being uncertain as to which piece of conflicting evidence is uh, the more credible, or indeed revising a judgment that um, the author had reached earlier and which perhaps uh, has diminished in credibility. I first became conscious of this sort of literature about 20 years ago when I read a very good book by a British historian called Mark Roseman called The Past in Hiding. And it, um, it deals with the uh, story of a German Jewish woman who survived the war in Germany in hiding. She was Marianne Ellenbogen, actually, ne Hirsch, uh, married a British officer and came here. And Roseman then discovered her papers, her letters, uh, and was able to interview her as well before she, before she died. Um, this is a form of literature that takes us right down to our last. Miller lecturer, Philippe Sands, uh, who spoke about his book, The Rat Line, that follows a rather different person in hiding, very different, uh, a very unpleasant man, I think, um, a, a Nazi war criminal of major proportions, one Otto von Wächter, who was the governor of Galicia in Poland and uh, therefore at the very epicenter 
of uh, of the Holocaust, um, because von Wächter um, was uh, a Viennese. Philippe Sands also wove into this uh, uh, book part of his own family story because his mother uh, comes fr from Vienna. Um, I suppose that Edmund de Waal's uh, Hair with the Amber Eyes uh, also fits into this category, uh, mixing in history and family memoir. Of course, this sort of uh, literature allows for considerable, considerably more uh, in the way of assumptions and conjectures and the drawing of inferences than does uh, conventional history. Um, that's not to say that uh, it departs entirely, of course, from historical practice, because assumptions have been part of the historian's trade forever. I remember many years ago reading um, a splendid book, uh, the British uh, philosopher of history, R.G. Collingwood's The Idea of History. Um, and in it, he wrote, I, I paraphrase, that if, he, if a historian had uh, reliable evidence that Caesar was in Rome on such and such a date, and within a reasonable period of time, uh, was then to be found in Gaul, it was reasonable to assume that he'd made the journey without the historian actually needing, as it were, the sort of Julian equivalent of an Alitalia boarding pass to show that he'd uh, crossed the Rubicon, or more geographically, probably more accurately, the Arno. Um, anyway, be that as it may, um, in historical quest fiction, as I've called it, we've moved into a sort of hinterland between history and fiction. And I'm now going to invite Bart Van Ness to uh, explain to us the differentiation between memoir, Holocaust fiction, and truth. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Godela. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, it means really a great deal to me to be given the chance to deliver this, the eighth uh, Martin Miller and Hannah Norbert Miller Memorial Lecture. Sadly, the series can rarely have felt more relevant, given the horrors perpetrated by Hamas just over a month ago. You don't look for relevance when you lecture on the Holocaust relevance is there at the best of times, and these are not the best of times. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I could not have imagined that I would receive an invitation like this one. However, a meeting on the 21st of December, 2014, ended up changing things radically, making it possible for me to be here today. That day, I met Lien de Jong, the Jewish girl who had hidden with my grandparents during the German occupation of the Netherlands. She was 81 by then, and yet, as far as I could remember, this was the first time that I had set eyes on her. I'd always known that my Dutch grandparents had sheltered Jewish children during the war, and that one of those children, this girl, Lien, had continued to live with them. She was there in the photographs of my parents' wedding. But I also knew that this was not a comfortable story some kind of row that I was vaguely aware of in the 1980s, something about a letter sent to my grandmother had severed contact. I remember my mother in tears, and after that, the subject was not to be mentioned. Only late in 2014, when my eldest uncle died, did I start to ask questions. Was Lean still living? Who was she? And what had happened? My mother still had her email address and had kept contact. And because of that, it wasn't actually very hard to get that first response from Lean. My subject today is the place of fiction in relation to the Holocaust. When I first came to Lean on a bright Sunday morning in December 2014, I didn't think that my background as a professor of literature would be especially relevant. 
If anything, it might be my experience as an archival scholar that would be of use. Supposing that Lean were interested in my writing something about her story, I would need to be sure of the facts. In the end, however, though, I did spend a lot of time in the archives. What would make the greatest impact on me and what would take the greatest amount of effort ended up not being the gathering of facts, but the act of creative writing, writing dialogue, plotting, working with metaphors, developing a literary structure. And if someone had said that to me on that first day in Amsterdam, it would have surprised and I think even worried me. After all, how comfortable should we be about mixing fact and fiction when it comes to the Holocaust? Writing anything like a novel about Lean's experience would have felt to me presumptuous, even exploitative. I would have said, I think, that when it comes to the Holocaust, we should stay as close as possible to the documents that Tony has mentioned and to witness statements. But now having written The Cutout Girl, I have a subtly different opinion. I think that the right kind of fiction can actually bring us closer to the truth. I want to begin by introducing someone. This is Lean, she's 90 now. My wife and I were at her 90th birthday party last September and she's one of our dearest friends and she's still very well. She's one of the 16,000 Jews who survived in hiding in the Netherlands, a frighteningly small number out of the 150,000 who were sent to Auschwitz and Sobibor with a survival rate of only 25% out of that large population, a shocking fact that I was barely aware of when I first went to see Lean. But this is Lean in that photograph that I took of her on that first day. Um, I pressed a buzzer on a block of flats in Amsterdam and took a lift to the third floor and she stood there waiting for me. And I stepped out of the lift and she said, let me look at you. And then very slowly she circled me and said, you look more like your mother. And then she sort of led me with mock formality along an open air landing to the glass doors of her apartment, which was clean lined and beautifully simple with modern art on the walls. And she made me a coffee and asked me what I was hoping to achieve. And I wasn't very sure myself and told her that I thought that recording a story like hers would be important. She said, I don't really have a story. And then with no sense of pathos at all, she said, without families, you don't get stories which ended up becoming the first line of my book. For about half an hour, Lean gave me a sort of interview, asking me about my opinions, my academic work. And then with astonishing quickness, which is very characteristic of her, she said, yes, I trust this. I could ask anything I wanted to. So I started with her earliest memories, her bedroom when she was a child growing up in the 1930s as part of a non-observant Dutch Jewish family, her mother, the clothes she wore, the food she liked. And that morning coffee, which was scheduled for an hour, spread into the afternoon and then the evening as a life came into view. And with the light already failing, Lean showed me the letter that she's actually unfolding in that photograph. And it's the most moving document I've ever held in my hands. And it still makes me cry when I read it, even now when I've read it aloud, um, many hundreds of times. It begins as follows. Most honored sir and madam, although you are unknown to me, I imagine you for myself as a man and a woman who will, as a father and mother, care for my only child. She has been taken from me by circumstance. May you, with the best will and wisdom, look after her. This letter, along with Lean herself, was handed to my grandparents in August 1942 by a member of the resistance. Lean was one of over 4,000 Dutch children saved from the Nazis in this manner, separate from her mother and father who were arrested soon afterwards and whom she never saw again. Lean's story turned out to be much more complicated than I had imagined. Having grown up in The Hague, 
as part of an extended family, though as an only child, in a non-observant Jewish family. She was taken south by the resistance, by rail, to Dordrecht, my grandparents' hometown, where she settled in well with the working class, non-Jewish family of my father. She was able to live out in the open under an assumed identity as the supposed niece of my grandmother, whose maiden name was in fact de Jong, the same as her family. Of course, she missed her parents dreadfully and she cried for days on end. A few months in, however, something surprising happened. Lena had been given two little rings by her parents, one gold and one silver. And in November 1942, only two months after moving in with my father's family, my grandmother had to tell her that it would not be possible for her to write to her father for his birthday. His papers, she said, had been lost. And when Lean heard this, she took those two ring, rings from her fingers and began to roll them up and down along the floorboards of the family kitchen until they slipped through the gaps in those floorboards. And Lean told me, I didn't think about my parents for a very long time after that and became in fact almost incapable of imagining what they looked like. So as an unconscious strategy for survival, the nine-year-old Lean transferred her love to, from her birth parents to my grandparents, fulfilling the noble wish expressed in her mother's letter that she will think only of you as her mother and father, and that in the moments of sadness that will come to her, you will comfort her as such. She began to think of herself as a Vaness. But the horror was not over. In March, 1943, a police raid on my grandparents' house, which Lean only very narrowly escaped, forced her to flee from this second place of safety. Chased by the highly efficient Dutch police force, which was staffed by collaborators, Lean hid altogether in nine different addresses over the course of the war, sometimes out in the open, sometimes hidden from sight. First, she was passed around houses in Dordrecht, and then, when this became too dangerous, she was brought to the village of Eiselmonde, not far from Rotterdam, just across the Maas River. And finally, following a second police raid, she ended up in the village of Benekom, which was my mother's home village, far in the east of the country. And it was only from there in late 1945 that she returned to the Van Es family in Dordrecht, by that point, deeply traumatized, amongst other things by terrible sexual abuse. So how could I tell this story? How could I connect that story of suffering to that modern sprightly 81 year old whom I had just met? One immediate problem that struck me as a potential writer was that Lean's memory became less and less reliable as she progressed through the war years. For her early childhood, and of her arrival with the Van Esses, she still had some sharp flashbulb memories. But as she passed from household to household, the pictures grew scarcer and grayer. The last years of the war were almost a total blank. Lien still had some photographs, like this one of her family on the beach in Scheveningen. Those are her parents embracing to the right of the woman holding the volleyball, who is the only woman in this picture to have survived. She also had a few objects, the most powerful being a friendship book or pussy album, which featured verses and cutouts from friends and family, first in The Hague and then in Dordrecht, where my uncle Case wrote the first entry. Very largely, however, these images and objects came without very much to weave around them. So Lean was, in a sense, right when she said that she had no story. My answer in the first instance was to travel the Netherlands in search of the places where Lean had hidden. I decided I would take photographs and speak to people and see if this could awake further memories in Lean, which to some extent it did. The process 
proved revelatory, teaching me many things about a country that I thought I had known. And most amazingly, turning up people who still remembered Lean as a child in hiding, even though she had long forgotten them. After that trip, which initially lasted a month, I found myself in a kind of stupor. I saw the present and the past overlapping this modern, efficient country and this past, which that country had seemingly largely forgotten. And I felt almost haunted. On getting home to Oxford, I began to write almost immediately and quite quickly wrote the first nine chapters, which describe Lean's early memory and my meetings with Lean. It was part memoir telling the story of my relationship to Lean and part novelization, working from Lean's childhood experiences and writing them up in the third person. I planned simply to write a book, but a friend told me that for this kind of book, you needed a literary agent. So I got an appointment with, I'm oh, sorry, that's another shot of the Pussy album, uh, with a man called David Miller. He had a look at those nine first chapters and he told me that he found them deeply moving. We met up uh, near Hyde Park at 11.30 in a pub um, <laughs> and had about five hours of drinking, which was my introduction to what it was like to have a literary agent. <laughs> Ended up having to lie down next to the Diana Memorial Fountain before I dared take the coach trip home. <laughs> But the surprising thing was that what David told me was to stop researching and start reading fiction. <clears throat> now, there are, I think, I think, some various ways in which the term Holocaust fiction, which is now actually a set search term on Amazon, should spark the distrust of serious readers. Simply at the presentational level, there's something homogenous about these books. Barbed wire, the Auschwitz gatehouse, stripes and Jewish stars used almost as a kind of logo. In some cases, such as say Limor Regev's The Boy from Block 66, the narratives are based on genuine stories of survival. And in others such as Tom Reppert's The Night at Midnight, they are pure historical novels. These are wor worlds in which the survivors are heroes. And at one level, this does help to preserve the memory of this darkest of moments in human history. Yet, as with a number of popular history books on Auschwitz, there's also, I think, the danger of a kind of kitsch flattening relatability, which makes the survivors active agents in a way they could never have been. Penguin recently sent me a book they are published titled, they are publishing titled Lovers in Auschwitz, A True Story. Now such work may or may not be well sourced or well written, but the kind of access that it gives us to that past is always going to pale in comparison to the scale and horror of the Shoah. The most famous of these fact fiction books is The Tattooist of Auschwitz by Hannah Morris seconded by John Boynes, the boy in the striped pajamas, which have each sold more than 10 million copies. Their authors going on to write sequels. Morris's book is said on the cover to be based on the powerful true story of Lale Sukolov. The author thanks Sukolov for, quote, trusting me to tell your and Gita story and promotional material for the novel stresses its status as a document and a meticulous reconstruction based on facts. The interviewee, however, died 12 years before the story was published, and no transcripts of any contact with Morris have ever been released. Whatever its origins, the book presents a bizarrely sexualized version of life in the death camp, a world where lovers run between barracks at night, where an SS officer facilitates a love affair between prisoners and takes advice on his own love life, from a Jew. In Morris's version of Auschwitz, the camp commandant has a Jewish sex slave called Silke, who alone amongst the women is allowed to keep, quote, her long cascading hair. 
Silka, quote, moves with the grace of a swan and when required, sleeps with the commandant in his, quote, large four poster bed. These unsourced and entirely implausible scenes are expanded upon in the sequel, Silka's Journey, despite expressions of outrage from the historical Celia Kovachova's surviving relatives. Boyne's The Boy in Striped Pajamas is different. It makes no claims to be factual and it's aimed at younger readers and can be read as a moral fable about the equality of human beings. All the same, three quarters of readers of the book in surveys believe it to be based on a true story when it is again a radically inaccurate portrayal of both Auschwitz and wartime Germany. In a world, in the world of Boyne's story, children, of whom there were actually very, very few in Auschwitz, are free to roam the camp and break with ease through a single perimeter fence. The child of an SS commander is presented as having no notion of anti-Semitism. And as with the tattooist, there's a problem here with the novelist wanting to place a modern story with a relatable modern protagonist in a pseudo historical setting. Now, David Miller did not tell me to read The Tattooist of Auschwitz or The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. He told me to read a half dozen classics of post-war European fiction. Fred Ullman's Reunion, Harry Bullock's The Assault, which Tony has mentioned, Willem Friedrich Hermann's The Dark Room of Damocles, and above all, the much celebrated trilogy of books by W.G. Sebold, Austerlitz, The Emigrants, and The Rings of Saturn. These are very different books from those by Morris and Boyne. All the same, in the case of, Aus uh, in the case of Sebold, there are potential parallels when it comes to the ethics of mixing fiction and truth when it comes to the Holocaust. Sebold, whose books came out in a flurry of creativity between 1992 and 2001 before his early death in a car accident, is credited as a pioneer of a new kind of creative nonfiction. His writings, which concentrate on German and Jewish history, blend personal memoir, travel, and biography with photographs and a lyrical prose that speaks of loss and alienation. One central subject is childhood and memory in Holocaust survivors. Unsurprising, therefore, that David Miller should have told me to read him. The first of Sebold's book to achieve worldwide acclaim as a masterpiece was The Emigrants, which begins as follows. At the end of September 1970, shortly before I took up my position in Norwich, I drove out to Hingham with Clara in search of somewhere to live. For some 25 kilometers, the road runs amidst fields and hedgerows, beneath spreading oak trees, past a few scattered hamlets, till Hingham appears, its asymmetrical gables, church tower and treetops barely rising above the flatland. This opening description is accompanied by a photograph and these continue to shadow the author's prose over the coming pages, thus anchoring the narration in fact. The narrator here is clearly Sebold himself, who did take up a position as a lecturer in German at Norwich in September 1970, and who did drive these 25 kilometers to a country village where he rented an apartment in a grand and beautiful house. That house, which is described in The Emigrants, is a quirky, quintessentially English setup with servants and a tennis court and an eccentric Englishman at its heart. The Englishman, Dr. Selwyn, is a passionate botanist who studied at Cambridge. Only slowly, as the Sabels get to know him better, does an underlying melancholy come to the surface. Later on, the old man confesses, Sabold uses this word, that he is in fact Jewish, that his parents fled with him from Lithuania, and that he took on his Englishness as a kind of disguise. Underneath this, he is haunted by a strong nostalgia for an irrecoverable past. In conclusion, Sebold tells us, the last time we saw him, 
was the day he brought Clara a bunch of white roses with twines of honeysuckle shortly before we left for a holiday in France. A few weeks later, late that summer, he took his own life with a bullet from his heavy hunting rifle. He had sat on the edge of his bed, we learned on our return from France, with the gun between his legs. The emigrants looks and reads like a memoir. In an interview, soon after the book's publication, Sebald reported that the story was essentially true with only the slightest alteration of names and timelines. At first, he had thought Dr. Selwyn entirely English, but doubts emerged during the first Christmas party at the great house. There was this huge living room and a blazing fire and one very incongruous lady. Dr. Selwyn introduced her as his sister from Tel Aviv. And of course, then I knew. Sebald's rendering of this story of a lost childhood is very powerful. And as I read it, I could not help but see connections to Lean. She too had a serious suicide attempt in the 1970s. She too had a stolen childhood. And for her likewise, I had photographs and documents as well as journeys over a flatland that seemed devoid of that kind of history. There is, however, a major problem with Sebald's account of his own working methods. He was lying. There was a real person behind the story of Henry Selwyn, a certain Phillips Rhodes Buckton, whom the Sebalds had, from whom the Sebalds had rented an apartment in a beautiful country house in the 1970s. And almost everything in Sebald's account is accurate, for Buckton was exactly like Selwyn, and he killed himself in the self-same manner. Only, as Carol Anger discovered only years later, Phillips Rhodes Buckton was not, in fact, Jewish, and his suicide had nothing to do with the Holocaust. It comes as shock when you realize that Sebold's works are fictions, because nothing in their presentation makes this explicit. Sebold knew Philip Buckton and used a great deal of his former landlord's biography to create the fictional character, Dr. Henry Selwyn, the Holocaust survivor, and then claimed that story as real. When Buckton's family read The Emigrants, they were deeply shocked. Moreover, Sebold knew several genuine child Holocaust survivors whose stories he used unacknowledged, sometimes lifting whole passages from diaries and deploying them in his fictions, altered but still recognizable. Again, there was outrage from several of these subjects. Carol Anger's superbly documented biography of Sebold, Speak Silence, reveals that the author constantly played fast and loose with the distinction between fact and fiction not only in his creative writing, but also in his interviews and academic publications. Sebald invented footnotes, doctored photographs, and repeatedly used the lives of real people, making them Jewish when they were not, or vice versa. He peppered these documents, uh, these uh, publications, with documents such as diaries and postcards without clear attribution or labeling, repeatedly anchoring the story in a seeming truth. Sebold is a far better writer than Heather Morris in The Tattooist of Auschwitz, but is his project ethically any different? With Morris, at least, you know that you are getting a fictionalized version of a true story. With Sebold, everything is hazy, both inside and beyond the books he publishes. For a non-Jewish German to do this, a German who incidentally repeatedly attacked the Allied bombing of his own country, feels like a dangerous step. Now, in the light of what I've said about Morris, Boyne and Sebold, it's tempting to reach for absolutes. Surely we need some clear lines of division. Fiction should be labeled as fiction. Truth should always be anchored in scholarship and concrete evidence. Facts should come with footnotes. Photographs must be labeled. There ought to be timelines, maps, documents should never be altered 
in their original state. In a world where false news is increasingly prevalent, where conspiracy theories proliferate, where trust in institutions is in abeyance, all forms of blurring between fact and fiction when it comes to the Holocaust feel like luxuries we can't afford. As an historical scholar and someone deeply invested in archives and verifiable knowledge, I have a lot of sympathy for that line of argument. Truth, however, is somewhat more complicated than the mere accumulation of facts. When I talked about Lean and her story as a Jewish girl in hiding in the occupied Netherlands, the first name that came up in conversation was of course that of Anne Frank. Lean's future husband, Albert, who also survived the occupation in hiding, actually knew Anne Frank and was there at the birthday party where she was given her diary. He appears in it very briefly. We are told that he jumped a year and that he's really clever. The diary is now the single most important individual Holocaust testimony. It gives the world a vivacious real person through whom we can understand the Holocaust at an emotional level. And the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam has become a site of pilgrimage as well as an important museum. The diary's authenticity is beyond question, but things do get more complicated when we ask ourselves where the source of that authenticity lies. Most people will read the diary as an artless personal testimony, and I see no problem in that. When we look closer though, we find that the division between fact and fiction in Anne Frank's diary is not so simple. It is in fact as much a work of art as it is an historical document. Anne Frank received a blank lined book with a clasp and a cloth cover on her birthday on the 12th of June, 1942, the image there. And she began writing in it straight away. On the first page, she glued a photograph of herself along with the words, gorgeous photograph, isn't it? Using four exclamation marks for emphasis. Thereafter come the famous words that now begin the standard edition of the diary. I hope I shall be able to confide in you completely as I have never been able to do in anyone before. And I hope that you will be a great support and comfort to me. What comes next though in the cloth booklet is not like a diary. Instead, we find a checklist of quote, the seven or 12 beautiful features, not mine, mind you, which start one, blue eyes, black hair, no. <laughs> Dimples in cheeks, yes. Dimple in chin, yes. And end finally on 12, intelligent, brackets, sometimes. <laughs> that list is dated the 28th of September, over three months after the first entry. As with Anne's comment about the gorgeous photograph, the checklist will be unfamiliar to most modern readers of the diary because both have been excluded in the edition we are used to reading. So the diary, which can seem and maybe needs to seem like a simple document, is in fact a layered creation in which Anne herself played in fact only the principal part. There were four volumes of the original notebooks, spanning dates from the 12th of June, 1942 to the 1st of August, 1944, as well as a large body of loose leaf <coughs> entries. These original volumes are scatty and inconsistent, especially so for the first half year or so in that first volume I showed you. Many of the sections are written to imagined characters such as Pop, Peen, Kit, and Laucher. And they take the form of drafts or actual versions of letters rather than diary entries. <coughs> the dating and ordering of this part of the book is extremely erratic. And there are numerous lists and inserts, such as, for example, 
an immensely long shopping list for an imaginary journey to Switzerland, which consists of glamorous items such as makeup, perfume, and immensely expensive dresses, all priced up. Um, the dresses are several hundred guilders each. Um, there are a great many photographs on which Anne offers a critical commentary on herself, often how great she looks, which is a good body image. Volume three of that sequence of uh, four volumes is lost. This version of the diary, if it can be called a diary, is known today by scholars as version A. <coughs> to add to complications, Anne began a second version of the diary, known as version B, early in 1944, after hearing a broadcast on Allied radio, which told her that diaries might be of use as a record after the war. This second version was intended for publication and rewrites the first. It's much more serious minded, including clear descriptions of anti-Jewish measures and has detailed descriptions of the hidden annex. It also gives Anne a more consistent and less flighty persona. It fixes the dating, which had been very erratic in the original volumes. It removes the sexual and personal details and makes the whole thing a much more conventional diary, now addressed to Dear Kitty. So it's quite different from that original book. The entry for the 24th of June, 1944, in version B, for example, reads as follows. Dear Kitty, it is boiling hot. We are all positively melting. And in this heat, I have to go on foot everywhere. Now I can fully appreciate how nice a tram is, but that is a forbidden luxury for us Jews. Shanks's pony is good enough for us. I had to visit the dentist in the Jan Lokenstrat in the lunch hour. And it carries on with the story of the visit to the dentist. Is this fiction? There's no entry for the 24th of June in the original notebook. And Anne, writing nearly two years later, is unlikely to have remembered the weather or to have known the exact date of a visit to the dentist. On the other hand, Anne must have gone to the dentist at some point and she would have remembered hot days and being excluded from the tram. Version B comes quite close to being a novel, albeit a novel informed by lived experience with the help of the notes provided by version A. The secret annex where Anne was hiding was discovered by the Nazis on the 4th of August, 1944. All eight inhabitants were sent to Auschwitz where they arrived on the 6th of September. Anne and her sister Margot were there for a month before being transferred to Bergen-Belsen where they died of typhus in March, 1945. Anne's father, Otto, was the group's sole survivor and he returned from Auschwitz to find that Mietrichis, who had helped them during their time in hiding, had been able to save Anne's papers, which he handed over to Otto in the summer of 1945. Otto read the diary in its two versions, in spasms of weeping. When he read of Anne's secret ambition to have her book published, he began to type up the papers and set about trying to achieve his daughter's wish. The book that we now know as Anne Frank's diary of a young girl is Otto Frank's tribute to his murdered daughter. Otto added no new material, but he did edit very heavily, removing a great deal of material as he blended versions A and B so as to make a coherent book. One might call it a work of creative nonfiction. In themselves, neither version A nor version B could have been as affecting as the text that Otto created. The Anne of version A has almost no sense of wider history. Her concern, unsurprisingly, is with friendships and quarrels, sharp character sketches, books, her likes and dislikes, her own body, her childhood love affairs. The Anne of version B, written by Anne at the age of 15, 
is much more determined to document history. She has less time for trivial matters and her style, unsurprisingly for a 15 year old, is rather heavy handed and portentous. Otto Frank's version brilliantly fused those two voices, the bright sparky voice of version A caught up in everyday matters, but also the wise and serious voice of version B powered by moral outrage and having a coherent story to tell. In a sense, the Anne who narrates the diary of a young girl never existed, or rather she existed across time and not at any specific moment. She is, I would argue, both a fictional character and a truer version of the Anne's we find in versions A and B. Through rewriting, creative invention, cutting, reordering, and conflation, Otto Frank and his daughter together were able to tell a story that carried a deeper truth than mere facts in themselves could ever convey. These changes are not a secret. You can track them as I have done in the Complete Works edition. But there is a case for reading immersively, for encountering Anne as a real person in your imagination, for not thinking too much in that instance about the process that brought this Anne into being. Now, there are many things that make the case of Anne's, Anne Frank's diary different from that of Sebold. Anne is telling a version of her own story and her father Otto clearly has a unique status as her loved surviving relative. Most editions of the diary also acknowledge the process of conflation, even if readers tend to think little about it and forget it as soon as they've perhaps seen that little note on the uh, facing side of the title page. What the process of creating the diary does show, however, is that fact and fiction are not quite opposites. Especially when it comes to childhood survivors, individual unfiltered testimony is bound to fall short of reality, no matter how authentic that testimony is. The triumph of the diary of a young girl is oddly a triumph rooted in the blurring of fact and fiction. And with that in mind, I think it's worth returning to Sebold's The Emigrants and Austerlitz, where the greatest concern is with childhood memory. Milan Kundra wrote that the novel examines, quote, not reality, but existence. And as Lynn Wolfe has argued, being true to existence is central to Sebold's poetics. Sebold talked about the blinding effect that photographs have on memory noting that images can end up replacing real people. He also believed that historical monographs could never be adequate to human experience. Sebold's answer to the problem of representing the Holocaust was to trust in literature. Through metaphor, fragmentation, temporal and geographic uh, disruption, he confronted his readers with an experience of loss and confusion on an ungraspable scale. The subjects of his books are defined through symbolic objects and structures. So Dr. Henry Selwyn is defined by his oversized house with its unmanageable garden. Paul Berita is defined by the railway lines on which he eventually commits suicide. Max Ferber through doctored photographs and sprawling fortresses end up being vital to the masterpiece Austerlitz. Now for Sebold, our sense of doubt as to whether we are reading history or fiction is part of an intended effect. Here, for example, is Sebold's account of the moment where the hero of Austerlitz, Jaco Austerlitz, remembers receiving the only picture he has of himself as a boy, the image that was used on the book's cover. The picture lay before me said Austerlitz, but I dared not touch it. And hard as I tried both that evening and later, I could not recollect myself in the part. I did recognize the unusual hairline, 
running at a slant over the forehead. But otherwise, all memory was extinguished in me by an overwhelming sense of the long years that had passed. I've studied the photograph many times since, the bare level field where I am standing, although I cannot think where it is, the blurred dark area above the horizon, the boy's curly hair, spectrally light around the outline of his head. These are the hallmarks of Sebold's Holocaust writing, the hypnotic meandering sentences, the spare but detailed prose, the presentation of landscapes and photographs as surfaces that refuse to yield meaning to the onlooker. Everywhere there is the elusive presence of Auschwitz, the ultimate featureless flat place of erasure. In this case, even there in the protagonist's name. Characteristically, Auschwitz lied about the photograph on which this passage was written. In interviews, he claimed that the boy, while not called Austerlitz, was a genuine survivor of the kinder transport, when in reality, as James Wood later discovered, it was simply a postcard from a Manchester shop. Sebold reveled in such deceptions. In life as well as art, he seems always to have had a highly elastic notion of truth. It is possible that this personal oddity made him a better writer, though I cannot say it made him a better person. His case is much more complicated than that of Anne Frank, where all the motivation is obviously genuine and pure. We can, though, learn things from Sebold's fictions. They are able to take us to a more nuanced truth. Sable did interview many Holocaust survivors and some Holocaust survivors were happy with the way that he created those fictions. My agent, David Miller, died tragically early, aged just 50, a little over a year after I met him. So he never got to read my finished book. I find it moving that his name should echo that of this lecture's founders. He had an enormous impact on me, and it feels right to acknowledge his influence on an occasion such as this. When I first met David, I'd written nine chapters of Lean Story in a version that was then called The Scrapbook. And it alternated a memoir of my friendship with Lean with a novelization of her memories. I had done a great deal of archival research, and my conviction was that historical truth should come uppermost. Dutch collaboration, the shocking 75% death rate, the documentation that proved Lean's story was true, dates and sources, including those of her parents' murders in Auschwitz. In the first chapter of that original version, I introduced myself very clearly explaining my credentials and my personal connection to Lean. The book I eventually wrote took shape under the influence of fiction, not only Sebold, but also Hermanns, Mulich, and Ullmann. It is shaped by metaphors, first of all that of the cutout, like those cutout girls in Crinoline's in her Pussy album, Lean had been scissored and pasted from one place into another, and this had happened again and again over the course of her life. The repeated displacement had affected her sense of memory. Thus, for the early part of the war, Lean still had those vibrant mental pictures, such as that of a small family gathering organized by her parents in their little flat, which was held on the night before she went away. Lean sat on the laps of all of the adults, and she behaved very badly, and yet she was not told off. That gathering was her own farewell party, but she as a child did not know this till afterwards, though perhaps she sensed it at some deeper level. The things that Lean remembered were lodged in her mind because she felt connected to people. But as the war progressed, as she was passed and passed between more and more households, her memories lessened. The images of the past became black and white, 
and then vast expanses of blank. Even afterwards, as an adult, she tells me, she finds it hard to remember dates, times, or places with any precision. So paradoxically, to be true to Lean's story, I needed to cut out some of the facts and also to disrupt the distinction between the imagined and the historical. In my new version, retitled The Cutout Girl, I left things hidden. Instead of immediate clarity about who I was, there were descriptions of the Dutch landscape, of the beauty of Lean's apartment. There were metaphors of warmth and color versus darkness and cold. On the printed page, I wanted the photograph to stand in space without either dates or labels. There would be no bibliography, no timeline, no family tree, no maps or diagrams, no suggestions for further reading. These absences were important, and so was the prose style, which should slip almost unnoticed between omniscience and Lean's own occluded vision. Most crucially, there would be whole chapters that conjured Lean's childhood journey, her witnessing of the market garden parachute landings in Arnhem, her conversations, the games she played, the clothes she wore, her narrow escapes from the police. Only afterwards would I tell the reader in a way that might shock them, that Lean remembered nothing of this. These scenes, one could say, were fictions, but they were grounded in truth. To write them, I used the eyewitness testimony of others and then placed the Lean that I knew in those situations. I tried to universalize Lean's experience, making her just one more cutout girl amongst the thousands, turning her loss of memory into a metaphor for the national amnesia in the Netherlands about the war. I've called this final part of my lecture Beyond the Cutout Girl, because as I said at the opening, meeting Lean has changed me personally, but also professionally. I met her as a Renaissance literature professor. A quiet return to that old form of scholarship now feels impossible. Footnoted academic articles and monographs are an important form of truth all the more so in a world of internet conspiracy theories. Yet there is also a form of truth in that new kind of writing to which Tony's referred, pioneered by authors like Sebold, which blends the factual and the creative. My most recent book is a non-fiction novel set in Shakespeare's England. And at Oxford, I'm currently part of a team designing a new master's course in creative non-fiction. A number of recent books by European writers, for example, Antonio Scurati's M, Son of the Century, on the rise of Mussolini, offer what seems to me transformative insight into the mindset that made the Holocaust possible. Insight that mere history, however detailed, cannot achieve. This kind of writing is starting to look like the new frontier of literature. The recent awards of Nobel Prizes to writers such as Olga Tokarczuk, Annie Arnaud, and Jorn Fosse are an indication of that. Compared to the vast body of historical work on the Second World War, literary writing is always going to be a minority interest. It demands stringency from both reader and writer alike. Still, I believe that those who wish truly to understand the Holocaust, in as far as this is ever possible, need also to encounter literature. Lean's insight that without stories, without families, you don't get stories, seems to me profoundly important. Stories are unreliable and sometimes wildly implausible, but they are also funny, tragic, human, and resonant. And for that reason, they can carry deeper and richer truths than mere facts. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very insightful and differentiated, nuanced, and entirely convincing talk. Thank you. Um, it was very, uh, yeah, it, it, it really made a big impression on me. Um, I, 
I just want to, so we have probably 10 minutes or so, so we'll we'll do some quick questions. I'll kick off with one. Um, I think um, you were very modest when you said you wrote uh, in the two genres of memoir and novel, because what is involved in that is not just a question of genre, it's also a question of perspective and of style. And what struck me very much when reading the parts where which you call novelistic is that you are using vocabulary. You are writing in the third person, but you're using vocabulary that she would have used. Yeah. Um, so that there's a lot more complexity in there, isn't there? Yes, so, absolutely. I, I wanted to create not a kind of child's voice exactly, mm. but a, but a kind of mindset uh, mm. that, for a start, knows very little about what's going on. Mm. So it's partly about keeping this very spare vocabulary, using words like papa and mama, um, just kind of noticing things that a little girl would notice. Mm -hmm. Um, but always not aware of the kind of larger things because that was so crucial to Lean's experience. You know, when she was picked up at the front door, of course she didn't know that she was being given away to a family elsewhere. That would have been, you know, would have destroyed the whole terrible project of getting her to survive and going off with this lady. So, you know, that Lean is excited. That Lean is, is you know, enjoying the jokes. Mm. But what, what I'm trying to do with that voice is kind of multiple things. It is what you'd call occluded third person narration so it's it's occluded because it sees things from the child's point of view but then there's also this kind of second kind of ironic level of the master narrator who is there who you know who knows for example of the kind of poignancy of the very idea of a railway journey mm. involving a, a jewish girl at this moment who knows that the reader can infer things um so yeah that was that was I think that's the thing that the novel can do. Um, I, mean, I think the novel is an extraordinary machine for accessing the complexity of human motivation. And, you know, compared to that memoir, it's, it's much flatter. It, it doesn't really allow you to kind of think anything that is subconscious effectively. I was very much thinking of Theodor Fontana's distinction between das Wirkliche und das Wahre. Mm. That's exactly what that is. Absolutely, it? yeah. And I think, you know, Sebold is, is such a fascinating figure in relation to that because, mm. you know, there is extraordinary wisdom in mm. him. Mm. He was a very serious thinker. And you, you can partly see that he's willing to make this kind of Faustian pact with, um, with mm. deception in order to create these, these, these astonishing works. Um, but but it also seems sort of beyond ethical to have, yes. <laughs> to have been prepared to lie yeah. and falsify things. Yeah. Yes, Ellen. Um, I have two questions, but I'll just do one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you think we do you think that creating nonfiction is more popular because we live in the information age and we're just so addicted to information that it feels kind of frivolous to read pure fiction? Ah, oh, that's a very interesting question. No, I think it's done by by the right people. I think I do genuinely think of it as a kind of frontier form of literature. I think a lot of the serious writing that's being done at the moment is in this very demanding area where you, where you actually make a kind of sincere contract with the reader to try and achieve that kind of higher form of that that Bieklika notion, the higher form of truth that is possible through um, imaginative engagement with basically the embodied nature of being a human, as well as the kind of historical sense of what's going on around you. So I think like, I mean, I think uh, Karl Ove Knausgaard, some people don't like him, I, I think it's written a masterful series of novels in the My Struggle series about his growth as a, as a person. These, these are Norwegian novels. Um, it's also a very serious treatment of Norwegian Nazism, if you, if you actually read the six volumes and his family's collaboration. And it, you know, it, it often involves that kind of slight intake of breath, as with the Sebold. I mean, it seems a very crass thing to do, to be prepared to call, as he did, that, that set of six novels, uh, My Struggle, and in, 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 the, uh, in the Norwegian, uh, it's kind of even closer to the to the German, um, but I, I think almost all the most important current literary fiction is being written in this this overlap form. So Annie Arnaud is is, is a good example, the most recent uh, Nobel winner, um, or Jon Fosse who won it this year, but Annie Arnaud the year before. 
but it's but I don't think that that's anything like the same as you know the kind of Heather Morris type stuff. That I think is very crass and does exactly the opposite because it doesn't deal with historical change. It um, it's kind of slightly monstrous in the way that it exploits um, the sort of tacky attraction of the horror of World War II. So I think, I, I suppose I think as a kind of bifurcation, there is a very cheap form of it. And that's also kind of true of quite a lot of kind of Netflix series and the like, which are trying to give you something that's kind of two in one, that's kind of, oh, this is, this is both true and it's a great story. And I, I'm very disturbed. I mean, I've had some contact with publishers over my new book and that one type of thing they just want is, oh, give us Shakespeare's world, but with a modern woman in it, that would be great. <laughs> you know, we want sex, we want Shakespeare. People buy that in their millions. It's like, mm, that's not at all what I'm interested in. I'm trying to show that the novel could do things and get us to see Shakespeare's world in a way that's radically different. One quick, oh dear. <laughs> One quick last question, I think. Yeah, Andrea? Uh well, I'm not sure if that's like quick to answer. It's about rape in the book. Mm -hmm. it's not very, uh, difficult to read. It was very brief in the book, of course. And yeah. it kind of foreshadows what then happens with the Ace family. Yeah. And and that does remain a sort of unclear mystery in the book. And I was just wondering, since you're so stupid, it's quite how you write, how, what, how, how to go about it. It's that sequence. Yes. And how yes. does it connect to Yeah, that's that's a, a very good question. I, I found that extraordinarily difficult to write. Uh, I mean, I found the whole process of writing the book very physically odd. I mean, I sort of actually sort of physically felt myself almost like a little girl as I was writing those sections in order to try and live them. Uh, so you do sort of come away from your desk kind of slightly disembodied and that scene was was particularly you know strange and traumatic to write because I wanted it to be in no way titillating obviously you don't want to write some kind of child porn but I also wanted it to be um explicit in making it very clear that this is a physical act of penetration this this is what it is this is how this person is being forced um so I again I was using that kind of not fully knowing the words lean said she didn't she didn't have words for it she doesn't know what's happening there's there's kind of blood there's this man doing things and she's wanted it herself as she's told and, and again that you have to not step in as a narrator and say obviously she doesn't want it herself you have to trust that the that the reader can 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 put in that moral perspective um i would not call what happened with my grandfather a rape um it's it's an unwanted sexual advance, which obviously uh, is the biggest problem with the book for my family. So that absolutely happened, uh, and my family have a massive problem with it happening. Uh, I felt absolutely morally bound to include it and to also there intervene myself and say, I believe this happened, uh, and so present it in in that way that it happened for lean that it that it is part of she's ill it's it's a kind of foggy experience she struggles to kind of be clear what exactly happened you know we we talked over it in a huge amount of detail and she was very happy with the version that that, that i gave to the account um it's it's very important that people kind of read the book kind of carefully and not see that as the entire solution to the problem of what went wrong with lean um but yeah i mean so my father yeah yeah no. I just meant if she wouldn't have been made before, one would leave that scene entirely different. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, and the Vanessas don't understand her in that sense. They don't know what's happened to her. And so, you know, the, the, the tragedy of it is obviously that they didn't give her the kind of level of reassurance that she needed. Um, you know, there's that terrible first rejection of her coming to them, which destroyed a huge amount. Um, but then hopefully we also see things from the Van Es perspective that they are getting an immensely difficult girl back. who they, they can't even begin to understand this gloomy, traumatized child and that they, they've had a tough war too. And you take you take someone like that into your family and it it is a, a kind of shadow on everyone. Uh, and, she, you know, she does say, you know, I was too much for them. I, I, I was a burden. Um, so, you know, there, there's that terrible repercussions of, of of the act in families as well and you know everybody's got families where people don't talk to each other anymore uh, and 
So in a way, it's a very small scale family event that, that people ran. Thank you so much for your <laughs> very thoughtful and honest uh, um, uh, talk and answers. Um, or a round of applause again.